Hi. Today we're going to talk about advanced directives with AngularJS. Uh, you probably spent some time learning up to this point. If you haven't, you should probably check out the previous entries in my screencasts that cover introductory techniques, uh, intermediate stuff, and gets you up to speed with sort of the basics of Angular. And if you've gotten to that point, you've probably become familiar with and comfortable with building applications, setting up things with the route provider, or maybe using something like UI router on the third party. Um, tools, you know how to use ng-repeat, you know how to leverage two-way data binding, and all of the, sort of the, the really basic productivity features that Angular gives you that, that uh, get you up to speed easily. And so what I want to do with this screencast is take a more advanced approach and a deep dive into um, directives. And the reason is uh, directives are absolutely powerful, um, and they give you the ability to craft a domain-specific language in your HTML. And the reason you'd want to do that uh, is maybe if you're building a library for consumption by other people, um, something like Ionic is an example of, uh, of a framework that uh, allows you to use custom directives to compose your UI. Uh, and you're creating, um, Ionic provides you with a domain-specific language, a bunch of different widgets that you can use to create. So the, the, the fact that is that that abstraction comes at a com cost of complexity um, when you're creating directives. And that complexity is what makes understanding Angular directives um, a real challenge because there's no way to avoid it as an implementer of a domain specific language um, which we're going to build with html you're going to have to observe that complexity cost somewhere and angular gives you the power to do it but is incredibly complex and hard to understand so hopefully as we dive into this this will give you a little bit more insight into um, how you can leverage this to um, better understand it, but then maybe some some techniques that you can use in your actual app application code. Um, so in this screencast, what we're going to cover as far as topics, um, as I mentioned, HTML as a domain specific language, which is what Angular lets you do, which you can use to craft abstractions. Um, specific Angular pieces that we're going to look at, the compile service template request and template cache, just very briefly, um, the directive definition object and the pieces that you're going to be able to understand about that. Uh, requiring other directives. There's a little bit of nuance there that we'll dig into. Um, isolate scope, ways to bind using um, value bindings, two-way bindings, and expression bindings. Uh, how to communicate between directives using scope.broadcast and scope.on. And yeah, that's it. So let's dive in and look. I'm just going to spin up a static web server here with the code, and this code will all be available on GitHub. Um, so this is the page here that we're working with, and the scenario is We've got uh, a, a web app that we're building, and we want to create a data component, a data grid component. And somebody has come to us and said, I need a, a data grid component, but I don't want the, the people that are going to be using this to have to know anything about HTML tables um, or how to, how to render that because tables are kind of confusing. So let's come up with a, a new language to describe how we're going to do that. So this is that language here that I've got on the left. So we've got a grid screen element. Uh, and inside of that, there's some columns that we're going to define, some of the things that you'd expect to see in a data table. Uh, you can see that each column has a title and a field and we'll dig into what those map to under the hood. But for right now, we don't need to understand too much more than, than what are the domain objects that we're working with. So we've got um, that grid screen, we've got a resource, so we're going to be pulling some data from somewhere, um, somehow under the hood. And then we've also got our grid element. Uh, we've also got um, a custom attribute directive here with inline editor. So we can look at this code and we can see the abstraction. We can and even without knowing what's going on under the hood, we can make some assumptions, reasonable assumptions about this. Um, and this is sort of the power of using Angular directives as a domain specific language. I know that this grid um, screen is going to load data remotely uh, from that URL. It's going to have some columns to show me product, description, and cost. And it's going to have an inline editor, which is probably going to allow me to expand each of those rows uh, and make changes to the data in. So let's dive in and take a look at how we're going to do this. First thing we need to do is set up our module. So let's do that. And I'm just going to open up the index file so you can see here. This is just basically plain old HTML. And um, nothing, I'm not using any build tools or anything like that just to try and keep it simple. So our dependencies for this are jQuery and Angular. Uh, I've got my app module, kind of where the, we're going to define the, the app, which you can see up here, the ng app. And then a uh, file where we're going to stick all of the directive definition objects and the, um, the JavaScript that's going to drive this. Uh, so I've got my, my code here. I've got a pre-formatted so that we can 
see what shows up on the screen. And then I've got the actual um, elements code here. And if we look in Canary uh, in the console, you see the first error that I get. Obviously, I don't have an app defined. So let's do that. That's pretty simple. Uh, so we want to add that. And again, we're not going to um, have any dependencies for this app. Uh, this will just get us passing uh, the first error. So that fixes that. But you know, again, the point of this is that we want to actually start crafting um, our domain-specific language. Remember uh, these pieces that we need to build. So if we just look at a high level, we can see that we need uh, a grid screen element. We need some grid columns. Um, the grid screen element is going to have a resource attribute that is just a, a URL. So that's important. So we need to think about that. Uh, within grid columns, we need a grid column element and then that grid element and then uh, this is the closing grid screen and as we start to craft this you'll see the way that angular um, parses the dom to get access to these elements compiles them and the order of execution and how that's relevant so let's start just by taking this code and pasting it into this grid directives here just so we have a reference and we can start composing things so the module that we're working with again is our app module and the first thing that we're going to want to do is start sort of uh, crafting the definitions for these directives. So we need grid screen, um, and I'm just going to put an empty object literal in there for now. So one thing I like to do is sort of look at the, the DSL that I'm creating, the custom elements, um, and how they work in concert, and just like flesh them out. So let's do that here. We've got a bunch of them. We've got grid screen. We've got grid columns. Uh, we've got a grid column singular. Then we've got our grid. Uh, we've got a width inline editor. So that's good as a starting cut. Uh, let's see. Um, all of these are going to be, uh, except with inline editor. With inline editor is going to be restricted to A. And if you've watched the other um, screencast, you'll know that that's just one of the uh, directive types that you can use. And A stands for um, an HTML attribute. So that's going to map to this attribute here. The other ones are all elements. So I'm just going to grab those and put an E in there. Let's see if I can do this the fancy way. Let's do that. Um, let's start with our grid screen directive. Let's add a linking function. And let's just put a logging statement in there. Let's go reload this guy. So we're going to get a bunch of errors. Um, and the first one is, uh, I'm actually using a, a shorthand that I used in a previous project. And so um, you can see here that I'm using Angular 1.4 beta 4, and it's got some nicer error uh, messages. This is still a little bit cryptic, but um, we can see that right away, uh, the argument that we're passing to directive is not a function and it needs to be a function. Uh, so let's do this. I'm just going to roll this back and come back here, make those functions and have them return the directive definition object. All right, now if we put our linking function in here, link my console.log. Let's jump back. There we go. I think I've got one more at the bottom that I need to do that for as well. So let's do that. And that should get rid of the errors. Make sure we got semicolons because we're working in JavaScript. So the object that we're returning here is the directive definition object. And now you can see that I've got linked screen and it showed up there. And I'm, I apologize if I'm moving pretty fast, but I've got a lot of stuff that I want to cover in here. And I'm actually going to split this screencast up into two parts. Um, so if you're feeling overwhelmed, one of the reasons is you can actually change the speed slider on YouTube and slow down the recording, uh, make me sound a lot funnier than I sound normally. Um, or you can speed it up if I'm not going fast enough for you. So uh, we can see that we got linked grid screen. Um, let's add a bunch more logging and link functions so that we can kind of see how Angular is um, calling link on each of these and sort of the order of execution. So here we've got grid columns. And here we've got a grid column. 
Here we got grid. And that inline editor guy. Okay, so you can see the order of execution. And this is important because uh, when Angular goes through um, its lifecycle phases, it's going to first scan the DOM for directives, then it executes the controller functions for each of those directives, if they exist, then it executes the linking functions. And the linking function basically um, returns, if it, if it is there, it can return a value that maps to um, the element that's going to replace this. And that's another property of the directive definition object that we can look at. But for now, we can see that um, Angular parsed these and it, and it scans and comes in and recurses and it will get to the child elements and they're the ones that execute first. And within this, uh, if we take a look at grid column, for example, you can see that I got three executions there. Um, if we actually log out the attributes for this, so if we go to grid column uh, and the arguments that you get to the linking function, uh, I believe are scope, element, attributes, and then the fourth one is a controller, which we don't actually have to find yet. Uh, so if we log out, uh, attributes, and I believe we had title, yeah, so let's log that out. Um, so we can see that uh, we got product, then description, then cost. Um, so it, it's actually going and parsing this one, then this one, then this one, uh, then the next one, it's going to come back up here and parse this one. Uh, then it's going to come down here and parse this one. Then it's going to parse the grid, which we can see there. And then all the way at the top, it's going to parse the grid screen. And so what we're doing here with these linking functions is some of these directives are going to map directly to templates that we're going to render. Some of them are going to map to domain concepts um, that we are going to use to set up data in the proper state. And so that's a little cryptic. So hopefully as we dig in, uh, you can see what that means. The piece that I wanted to show you here was the, the order in which it does it, uh, the, the linking function execution. So we, we dive in um, and go sort of into the deepest child and then come back out and execute the parents. You can actually change the order that that happens and if that's relevant for you um, by setting up something called a pre. So if we change our grid column here, link can actually be a function or we can make it an object literal with a pre, which maps to the same function. And if we reload that, you can see that that didn't change anything, but if I switch that over to post, that still didn't change anything either. Now this may be because I'm using Angular 1.4 beta, but in previous versions, you could actually uh, modify these two and have them, let's see if we can duplicate this and change the order. Interesting. So in previous iterations, it would actually control the order of execution. So pre would go last to first, for execution order and post would go first to last, or it, it might've been the other way around. So you can see that they're both being ex executed, um, but uh, the, the order that they were executed hasn't changed. And that that seems like it might be a new feature in Angular 1.4, uh, but we're not gonna get hung up on, up on that too much. So let's just jump back here and make our single linking function. So I mentioned before that uh, some of these elements are gonna bind directly to templates that we're going to render, and some are going to map to domain concepts. So if we think about the domain objects that we're working with, um, when we're talking about rendering a, a sort of a table with inline editor rows, I think there's probably three domain objects that we're, we're thinking about, and they're pretty simple. Um, we're looking at our editor object, which has the ability to edit, and then we're looking at columns and rows. And so one of the ways that I like to think about uh, directives and sort of this domain specific language that we're creating is I don't like to think too hard about what the output markup is gonna be rendered as we're gonna get to that point. But at this point, I just wanna think of what should I be doing when I detect these elements um, to set up my domain objects, uh, the data essentially in, in a state that I can get ready to, 
to use that to actually render those custom templates. So in this case, when I when I have a grid column, what does that mean? It means I should probably add an entry to my list of columns, which is just going to be an array. Um, and the rows are going to come from this resource from uh, API slash data slash JSON. So I guess the first thing we'd probably want to do is fetch that resource. So we're not going to use a service or anything. We're going to keep it simple. Let's start by um, fetching the resource. And the responsibility of that, uh, because the resource attribute lives on the grid screen, that's where it's going to live. So let's do that here. So in our linking function, uh, the first thing that we want to do is obviously get that. And again, the arguments for this are scope, element, attributes. This is just something you kind of have to internalize and, and memorize. Um, they're always the same. And, and again, that fourth optional one is controller, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. So let's uh, use the attribute, that resource attribute, um, to fetch our, our stub. And I've got a little folder here with API and data.json. We can take a look at this is the data that we're going to leverage. Uh, we've got some products. They each have a description and a cost, widgets, pants, and cows. So that's what we're going to fetch, and that's what we're going to use to render our data table. All right, so let's grab that. And the thing that we're going to grab uh, this in our DSL resource maps directly to a URL. Um, so let's do that to say attributes.resource so that we can get that. Um, and then on success, we want to grab that response. And then we're going to start sort of um, managing those domain objects. So again, the, the data table is going to map directly to uh, the, the response for the data is going to map directly to our domain object of rows. So we can add that to scope. Let's say response dot um, data. And we'll leave that logging in there. And uh, if we go back here and reload, we can see that an XHR fired for API data JSON. So that's you know a real simple mapping of I have some attribute and I want to fetch some data. That's a way that you can do that. Let's make sure that that actually got bound. So if we take a look at this guy and this one, this is the one that we're working with. This is just a pre-formatted so we can see what's there. And the neat little trick is I can hit escape to bring up the split pane. So I've got this one selected in Chrome DevTools. I'm just going to clear the console. I'm going to type dollar zero, and that gets me a reference to the current element that's selected in Chrome DevTools. And Angular has a, a built-in um, function on the global, so angular.element. And if I pass that dollar zero resource, uh, you can see that I got the selected version of that. But then I get access to the internal state, so I can say scope. And we can take a look at that. Uh, and you can see that scope.rows, which we assigned in that uh, JavaScript code, has an array of three objects. So there they are, cost. So those are our products. So that worked. Uh, let's take the next step and look at uh, columns as our, our domain object. So where are we going to manage columns? Uh, the place that we need to do that, uh, if we think of this top level object as sort of the orchestrator of our, of our um, grid screen is going to orchestrate everything. So it's going to know about the columns. It's going to know about the editor. Uh, it's fetching the rows at, at the beginning. And in order to do that, we need to add a controller. So let's do that. And the way I like to think about controllers in a directive is they expose functions or methods on the controller that child elements can call. Um, and because of the nature of execution of these directives, again, this one's going to be executed first, then second, then third, and then we come back up to grid columns, then we go down to uh, with inline editor, then to grid, and then finally, uh, this, this guy is going to be the last one executed. So we're guaranteed that um, all of the information that we need uh, that we're going to derive for our domain is going to be available by the time that this linking function executes. And, and again, the controller executes before the linking function. So if we add a controller here, uh, we just need to make sure that we're exposing our methods properly. So let's add scope uh, in here. And again, the difference between dollar scope and scope, I think, is just purely convention. Um, the way that this is injected, uh, this maps to the scope for this element. Um, this also maps to that same scope. So they are the same thing despite the dollar uh, versus the, the non-dollar. So let's look at, we want to manage row uh, columns in here. This guy's going to know about how many columns we have, uh, and then the editor. So let's make a couple of methods that we can allow our child directives to call, um, and we'll look at how to require the parent directive in those children. So we want to be able to set an editor. So let's say this dot set editor is a function, and we're going to take a reference to an editor. 
And we don't know what editor is yet um, because we haven't implemented that, but this is sort of our top level API um, that we're gonna expose to the children. So we're gonna say set editor, uh, and then we're gonna have another function called uh, set columns because the children are gonna be the ones that uh, are adding to that list, but the place that we aggregate them is at the, the top level here. So we'll say sets columns, and these are basically just simple setters. So we've got our list of columns and the place that we're gonna set it is on the scope. So let's do that. And well, I'm gonna leave that implementation for later so that we can take a look at it. So we've got our two functions. So let's jump into grid column and grid columns and see how we're actually gonna call that because the, the linking function for grid column is gonna have the proper information to be able to call add column. And the place that we're gonna call add column is probably on this guy. And this guy is probably going to call set columns up at the top parent. So we'll need to add a couple implementation details for that. So let's start with um, grid columns and I'm just gonna collapse this first one uh, so that we can still see the, the HTML code there. So again, our three domain objects, editor, um, edit, columns and rows, we took care of columns, we fetched the rows, we still haven't done this one, but we'll do that a little bit later. So for right now, we need to be able to uh, have an, uh, a method on the parent um, grid columns so that we can aggregate each of these. So let's do that. We'll add a controller. So it's gonna be the one that stores the columns. So let's keep our um, domain object in the controller here, uh, the columns for the table. Uh, we're gonna need a, a couple of methods that the child elements can access. So we wanna call add column. So let's do that. And this is just gonna be a function that uh, pushes a column onto that list. So pretty simple, plain old JavaScript. Um, and then we're gonna add a getter as well. Getters and setters are usually uh, a lot of what we see inside of controllers for, um, I guess these aggregator objects, right? Because there's no there's no template that's gonna map to render to this in the DOM. We're just using it as a way to um, allow HTML to uh, define um, what the state of our domain is or our domain objects. So in this case, um, manage all of the columns. And in this case, add an individual column to that list of managed columns up here. So this is just gonna return columns. And let's do our linking function implementation. So here's where uh, at this point, um, we're assuming that uh, we've got the list of columns. Uh, the child directives will have called add column when their linking function executed. Uh, and so when we link this one, we can call up to our parent, uh, which is the grid screen. And the method that we added there was set columns um, that we're going to say, hey, um, grid screen, um, all my children have executed. They've told me what columns I need and I've got that information and I'm ready to pass it up to you. So let's do that. Um, this is where we need to be able to call that function that we added, that set columns. So let's collapse that again. So set columns is what we're working with. Let's just spike it out here, what we want to kind of call. Uh, we want to call set columns with some list of columns, um, get columns, for example. So that's what we want to call, but we don't have access to set columns here. And this is where we take a look at the restrict keyword, or sorry, not restrict, require. And require allows us to define either um, a string or an array of strings that map to um, directives that we want to access uh, and, and require uh, will fail actually if we can't get to those. So let's do the first one here. Let's say we want the grid screen because that's um, where we can grab that get, uh, set columns. So I'm gonna set a require grid screen so that I can access this directive. And the thing that's going to be accessible um, is a little confusing. It's not the directive itself. It's not this function. It's actually the controller function. And so this is how you can uh, access um, public API methods on parent elements uh, by requiring them and not having to have any sort of explicit coupling between them. This is one of the features of Angular directives. So uh, again, the place that we, we did that was we said grid screen. Uh, so if, I'm just gonna comment this guy out because we should get an error right away 
when we reload this. And so one of the things that you'll see is if you're using require, uh, again, we put the require on this guy and we said it requires grid screen, um, but it couldn't find it. The default place that Angular tries to resolve when you require another directive in a directive um, is on the element itself. So on this element, it will look for it. And we're actually not looking on that element. We're looking up one uh, parent element. So let's jump in there and add this little special character. Like that, the carrot. And so the, the two ways that you can require, you can require a directive that exists within the same element uh, by omitting that carrot. And if you're looking up the stack, you can add that and it will not have that error anymore. Uh, so that doesn't get, get us anything. Let's, um, let's see how we can access that. And again, the thing that you're requiring, remember, is not the directive itself, even though this is the name of the directive, it's actually this controller instance. Um, which will be injected. And if you remember before, I mentioned that there's that fourth argument to the linking function, which is uh, a controller. So in this case, that controller will map to this. Uh, so we can name it appropriately. It doesn't have to be called controller. We can name it whatever we want. So let's be explicit so that we remember. Let's call it grid screen controller. Uh, and then now we have access to grid screen controller dot set columns. Uh, so I haven't touched on get columns yet, but let's see this explode. Um, get columns is not defined. And so where get columns exists, and this is sort of one of the, the common dilemmas when you're working with creating advanced directives, is how do I get access to my own controller? Uh, and the answer is you use the require um, the same. So require can be uh, an array or it can be a single string. So let's make an array. And let's say we need to require my parent, which is the grid screen. So that's going to be called grid screen controller. But then I need to require myself. Uh, so let's require grid columns. And then the only thing that changes is this um, fourth argument is no longer a single controller. It actually maps to an array of those injected controllers. Um, and remember, we're requiring the directive, but it's going to inject the instance of the controller that maps to that directive. It's a little confusing. So let's call this controllers. Uh, and we'll say that our grid screen controller uh, is equal to um, the first one, because it's an array. And we'll make another one. And just to be safe, we'll call it grid columns controller. And that's the second one. And now we have access to um, get columns there. And we have access to set columns there. So that's how you can um, require controllers from other directives using the directive name as a reference. And this is a way that you can expose pieces, um, thinking of encapsulation, public API pieces, so the methods that I'm going to use, um, but keep things private, right? I'm not going to expose columns directly. I'm only going to expose methods that can interact on them. And similarly to uh, the editor and at the top level here, I'm only going to expose methods that can uh, set the context for that thing globally. So this allows you to maintain encapsulation, have private and public state um, between directives. So let's see if that still explodes. Good. And if we take a look at uh, this method, um, it's basically pushing the list of columns. Now, we haven't implemented the child directive yet to actually add that. So let's recap. To this point, we have grid screen, which is fetching our remote data. We have grid columns, which is exposing an add column and get columns method. Uh, and what we need to do now is build the implementation for these individual items that are going to add an entry by calling add column. And then basically, uh, when we get to the final state, grid screen is going to have access to all that stuff uh, within its implementation. For example, this guy, so scope.calls. So we've done those first two, grid screen, grid columns. Let's do the third one so that we can actually see how Angular works to map HTML elements, custom elements, to domain concepts, columns and rows of data, um, and communicate using require up the chain to uh, get our data in a state where we will be ready to render it. All this stuff is basically just getting our, our data for our domain objects in the proper state. We haven't even rendered a template yet. So let's do that. So here's grid column. And again, uh, the method that we're gonna access is available on the parent element and it's called add column. So that should clue you in that we need to require 
Uh, and we can't forget the caret because it's a parent. Grid columns, the name of the directive, not the name of the controller. So that will give us access to this controller. And uh, let's name it because it's our single one. Grid columns controller, just so we have a reference to it. Again, the method that we're going to call is exposed here. It's called add columns. So let's say grid, grid columns controller dot add column. And the thing that we want to add is an object literal um, that's going to be something that represents a column in our domain. And if you remember, let me just collapse this. And we can see back up here, we have two attributes. We have title and a field that uh, those are the relevant pieces of information. So we're translating this HTML element and its attributes um, to some object in our domain, in this case, a column. So it's just a plain old object literal. Uh, and we want to grab title from attributes.title. And we want to grab field from attributes.field. So this is just translating HTML custom elements into uh, data for domain objects. And this is sort of a common thing that you're going to do with um, directives when you're building sort of custom components like this that work in, in concert with each other. HTML elements, my domain specific language in HTML, translating to data objects, value objects. Um, and then the third piece is the actual HTML template and how I want that to render. And those are going to consume those domain objects that this uh, these directives are setting up, if that makes sense. So we're going to do that. And then let's uh, let's run that. So that seems OK. Let's do our inspect trick and grab this guy. And I'll hit escape again to bring up the console. Let's do our angular.element with the scope. And now we can see that we've got columns. So remember, rows is our data that maps. And columns is those individual value objects. Cool. So now we've used HTML uh, in the browser. Angular's parsed it. It's linked it. It's compiled those elements. Um, it's executed the linking functions. It's required the parent controller so that we can access those public API methods that map to our domain concepts. And we've created value objects that exist um, at the top level. So we're ready. We're getting closer to being able to render the actual table. And that's sort of what the, the end goal is for this and what we're going to take a look at. All right. So that's that guy. Uh, what do we need to work on next? We need the actual um, grid implementation which is up next here. So let's take a look at this one. And we don't actually need a linking function for the grid. We just need a controller. So some the relationship between directives, you know, you might think that you need a linking function. Uh, you don't always need a linking function. But if you need access to um, the attributes uh, of the, the element in question, so in this case, um, we do have with inline editor, but we don't need access to that attribute because it doesn't have a value. The presence of that attribute is going to indicate some behavior uh, in our domain. So let's see, what do we need? We need the scope. And at, at the point that the directive, um, the grid directive is concerned, uh, it needs all of the information to be able to render itself. Uh, and it's also going to need a template. So we're going to, um, just trying to think of where to start here. Let's start with a template. So we need a template. And I'm going to create a template URL. And let's say we're going to do templates. Uh, these are empty, but we're going to we're going to create them. So we want uh, templates slash uh, as table dot HTML. That's the template, uh, template that we're going to use. And the second part of this screencast is actually going to focus on taking what we're building here, um, divorcing our code from uh, the HTML templates, and actually calling out to a third-party API to render. So using our domain objects of um, rows and columns and an, the concept of an inline editor, but not having to implement that ourselves, we're still going to use our custom framework, uh, but we're going to let Angular call out to a third party library like jQuery data tables or Kendo UI. That's in the second part uh, of the screencast. For now, we're just going to do the first implementation because I think it's important to understand how we're binding domain com concepts in HTML um, to value objects in our domain to then render HTML on the output. So let's do that. We're going to we're going to have this um, when we're working with directives and you you give it a template URL uh, as opposed to just a template. This means that Angular will actually fire a request for that if that template doesn't exist in the template cache. Uh, template cache is a injectable service 
um, that you can use to access templates that have been compiled. In this case, providing template URL means that it's going to fetch that. So let's see this explode. We can actually see that the file did exist, um, but I've got nothing inside of it. Uh, so there's nothing in that response, uh, which you can see here as table. All right. So the next piece we need is we need to tell, um, if we actually look back here in the DOM, we need to tell Angular that uh, we want to replace this element with something, uh, which is going to end up being our, our rendered table. So let's do that. Uh, we can just, in the directive definition object, again, that's this object here that we're returning. Uh, we can just say replace true. And if we go into this as table and we just add a, we'll add that for now we can see that uh, it replaced that element with pi. Um, so this is how you can uh, configure Angular with custom directives to say, uh, I want you to execute some behavior when you detect this, maybe in the linking function for this custom directive, uh, but then I also want you to replace this element with uh, an actual HTML element, or uh, not an actual HTML element, because these are all HTML elements according to um, the spec. They kind of look like XML but uh, they don't have any style rendering properties. So if you want, uh, that's what I mean by actual HTML. Um, it's things that the browser is gonna recognize and know how to, how to render. In this case, we wanna do a table. So let's do that. I'm gonna use Emmet to sort of spike this out. And if you're not familiar with Emmet, It is basically a port of, um, used to be called Zen coding for Sublime Text, and it allows you to use CSS selectors to expand HTML elements. So we want a table with a class of grid. Inside of that, we want a TR and a TH. So if I do that, that gives me that expansion. Um, and then beside that, we need a sibling of T body. And in that, we need a TR and a TD. And I think, just trying to think of how far to go here. That's pretty good. So again, these are, um, Emmet allows you to do CSS selector expansion into HTML fragments. Uh, the sibling selector, um, if I expand this out, I'm just gonna copy this so you can see it after I expand it. There we go. I'll put a comment there. So this is the structure that we want uh, to render basically. So let's take a look now. So again, we have nothing um, in there. And actually, I think there's probably an error. Yeah, this is a common error when you're working with directives. So template for directive grid must have exactly one root element templates as table. So let's fix that. Uh, the reason it's complaining is because I have a comment. And according to Angular, a comment is actually a valid HTML element. So let's get rid of that. There we go. So here's our table. Not very useful. Uh, we have our class of grid. Um, notice that the attribute with inline editor was transferred over from the previous um, directive element. So if we jump back here and see that we have grid with inline editor. So any attributes that exist on the, the custom element that you're creating, the custom directive will actually get trans transferred over. And this is useful because we need that to uh, be still be executed, even though it's replacing the original element with this element. So let's take a look at the next steps we need to get our, our data rendering. And the way that I like to think about this is we're working with this grid screen at the top and he's sort of the, as I mentioned before, the aggregator, he has the data, he knows at the, the point at which uh, we're gonna be able to render. So we're gonna broadcast an event um, from him. And we're, the point that we know we have all this data is at the linking function, because he's the last linking function to be executed again. Uh, these will be executed first, then this one, then uh, this one, then this one, and then this one. So we know that our data, um, our domain objects, the value objects are gonna be in the proper state. So at this point, we can just sort of fire an event uh, and say, hey, rest of things uh, in, in the directive chain, you guys are, are ready to render. So let's replace this guy. Uh, and get rid of that. So in here, once we fetch the data, that asynchronous dependency, we know that we're, we're able to render. So we can pass a message down or, or broadcast a message out to any components that are interested. So let's do that. Uh, we can use scope.broadcast and it takes a couple of arguments. So let's say we're just gonna call it ready to render. And the thing that we want to pass along, because we can pass along information that, that our consumers of this event might be interested in uh, is rows and columns are value objects for the domain that we're working in. 
And then way down here in this guy, let's listen to that event so that we know what we can do. So we can, in the controller, we can say, um, I want to listen to ready to render and I want to execute a function. Um, there's a couple arguments, just like sort of jQuery event handlers, you're going to get uh, the first argument is an, uh, an event object. And so we're going to ignore that for now. And then uh, any of those additional arguments that were passed down. So rows and columns. So let's do that. Uh, first, let's just log rows and columns to make sure that we got things in the right state. So we got rows. Here it is. Um, but we didn't get columns. And this sort of brings up an interesting point. Why do we not have access to columns um, even though we passed it here? Oh, it's because I called it calls. You can see here instead of columns. So let's fix that. There we go. Now we got rows and we got columns. So the parent broadcasted an event when it had aggregated all of its data and it was able to pass it down to its child. So now uh, what we want to be able to do um, is actually render this guy. And so the piece that we need uh, in the scope of this table um, is the actual rows and columns. And so in order to do that, uh, we need to make it available in the scope. So once we're ready to render, we have access to the scope. We can provide those things locally. Um, and let's just change this to calls to be consistent. So now those are available on the scope. And now if we implement this uh, this table code, we can actually start looking at this. So our structure, um, we've got rows and columns available um, on the scope. So that means they're available in, in bindings, references within Angular. So we can use that. And one really useful uh, trick for debugging this stuff is if I've got this element and I wanna see, for example, uh, let's just go in here. And let's uh, render those things out, so rows, to make sure that we've got our plumbing wired up. And I can pipe it uh, using the filter operator to an internal pipe called JSON. And let's do the same thing for calls. And if everything's worked and everything's wired up, this allows us to verify that uh, we're getting those values. So there I can see that I've got my uh, rows here and I've got my column definitions. So my I can see that all the plumbing's working. I've got the, the domain objects ready uh, to be rendered. So let's let's implement this. This is pretty trivial. So our table had a row we want to ng repeat, and we want to repeat for call in calls, column.title. And if you remember, let me just split the view here. Um, the thing that we added to grid column was that domain object we said, hey, grid columns controller, add a column with a title and a field to map those HTML attributes in. So that's gonna do that. Let's see if that works. Oop, I did my reference thing there, call.title. So there we go, we've got product and description in our table header. And uh, let's actually repeat for this thing. So we want to repeat for each uh, table row in row, so row in rows. And then within that, we also want to use the column again. So we want to repeat for call in calls. And let's add our data. Uh, so we want row at column dot field. That's the value. And one of the nice things about Angular, um, this is an Angular expression and it's not JavaScript, it's not actual JavaScript, but it's like JavaScript. So we know that our row um, is an object and we know that column.field is the key that we wanna look up uh, that, um, that value in. So let's see if this works. And I've typed something wrong. So when I'm gonna use my trick where I grab this element and look at the scope. And I'm doing that thing again where I type the wrong value. So there, there's our table rendering. We don't have the inline editor portion, but this is um, pretty decent that we were able to sort of map um, our custom code up here, the, the uh, 
the directive elements that we want to create and, and render a table. Maybe not super useful uh, in, its, in its own right. Why would you do this when you could just use a table? But the focus is not on the specific implementation here. It's on the concept and being able to map um, custom HTML treat it as a domain specific language um, using Angular's directives, map it into domain value objects, and then be able to convert those into something that's rendered on the screen. And that idea um, ultimately is, I think, really powerful and revolutionary. It's what we're gonna see in web components. So this is a pretty cool uh, feature of Angular. So that's cool. Let's do the inline editor piece because what, uh, good, would be, uh, Dave, what good would a data table be without an inline editor? So let's do that. So again, this inline editor is an attribute directive. And we're going to need, um, if you remember way back up here, we had a set editor method that we didn't, uh, we didn't implement. So the, the domain objects that we're working with, rows, columns, and an editor, and the ability to edit the, the specific row um, and any column values. So our sort of um, aggregator guy, the grid screen at the very top, he's going to expose that set editor method. So that's what we're going to call from uh, the linking function that with inline editor directive is going to execute. So let's set that up. Uh, to be able to do that again, we need to require the grid screen directive, which will give us access to this controller, which will expose these methods. Um, but remember, we need to require the name of the directive, not the controller instance, even though the controller instance is what will be um, injected. And again, uh, we need to reference the parent because it's not a property of the existing directive that we're requiring. And grid screen controller as that fourth argument. So now we have access to the set editor method and we can grab the editor. So let's say grid screen controller dot set editor. Uh, and I'm just going to create uh, an object that will to represent my editor. Uh, in the second part, when we work with binding to a third-party library, we may use a different um, concept here. But for now, uh, I'm just going to say the title is edit. Um, and the field that I want to edit uh, is just going to be an empty string for now. So let's see if that worked. I don't think I had any errors. Let's do our trick again on this guy. What does my set editor method do? Right, I haven't actually done anything in the implementation of that yet. Uh, so when we call set editor, um, what I'm going to do is actually uh, put the editor as a column um, so that it will render um, because we're going to want a little uh, triangle widget uh, so that we can click on it, the, the table row will drop down. So bear, me, bear with me as I do that. Uh, so we're going to say scope.columns.unshift editor. So this is the implementation of, uh, of what we're doing here. So let's render that. And we didn't get anything uh, because I haven't done the implementation inside of the template yet. So I'm going to basically unshift puts the, the editor um, at the beginning. So our editor is kind of treated like a column, but it's going to be put at the beginning. Unshift will put it at the beginning of the array. Okay, let's jump down to, so that's all we need for with inline editor. And let's see if we can get uh, that stuff to show up. So Right now it's not showing anything because I don't have a binding that maps to that. So we need to add a conditional that will render this. So inside of our repeat, we're gonna have two elements. We're gonna have a span. Um, and in the case that it's an editor column or not an editor column, we can use ngf to check that. Uh, so we can say call dot, oh, I need to be inside that other repeat. So if the title, again, using uh, Angular expression syntax, this is kind of JavaScript, -y, but not really JavaScript under the hood. So if it's not edit, um, then we can type in our value here. So let's see if that still renders. 
that looks good. Oh, I've actually got a an error. That's why it wasn't showing up. Let's fix that. Right. I really got to... This is going to be the bane of my existence in this one. There we go. Now we have our edit column. And I was wondering why that wasn't showing up. So um, we've got that edit column. And this is where we're going to put the, the triangle, uh, the expander for our row. Um, and so I didn't even need to dive into the template. So I apologize for that. But um, all right. So we can still go ahead and do this because we want to um, make sure that we don't render this expression uh, if it is an edit row. So let's duplicate this and say if it is edit. Let's put our um, expander and I just need to find the markup for that. So let's get rid of this for now and just this uh, HTML entity maps to that. So now we get uh, without having to use an image or anything like that. So this this guy is what we're going to use to expand. And uh, if you saw, I, I kind of took out the, the finished version because I'm cheating and I have all the code on the side because uh, I've written this before. Um, but we're going to add an ng click binding to edit the specific row. Um, so edit is going to exist somewhere uh, and we're going to pass it in. So in order to do this, we could bind directly. But remember that the scope where this um, expression would be evaluated is the scope for this current item. And the only pieces that we have available on this scope are um, row and column. And so whenever I look at something like this and I think, well, you know, I could just add another function to um, the uh, the grid, for example, but it's not really a, responsible, uh, a responsibility of the grid. There's an abstraction sort of waiting to be extracted from here. Uh, so when I was creating this, I actually went ahead and added another directive. Um, so let's do that. So we've got with inline editor. Let's add another one called, and let me just spin back here. Uh, let's call it uh, editor initializer, because that's effectively what we're going to do. And again, we're going to return that directive definition object. Um, in this case, it's going to be an element. So let's let's just do that, and let's add the linking function. And let's see uh, if we can get that to execute. So linked editor initializer. And if we go back to the table and we replace this guy with uh, that element, editor initializer. Let's get rid of that. Let's make sure our plumbing is working. Good. We've got the linked editor initializer down here. So now we need to add, add back the implementation for that. And you can see here, I've got the editor initializer over here. So let's plug in that template. Uh, and if we do that, that's still not going to do anything because we haven't passed the template reference. So let's do that. Again, template URL. And so we're going to say uh, templates slash editor initializer. There we go. Now it's showing up. And we want to add some behavior. When you click on that, we're going to expand the inline editor. And this is sort of gets to the point of when you've got directives that are going to add um, DOM event handlers uh, or things like that, this is where you can do that. So let's say we've got the scope, element, attributes. And by this, I mean the linking function. Sorry, I should have elaborated on that. So the linking function is where we have access to the, the native DOM element. And this is where we can use something like jQuery if you're using it, or just jqlite, which is built into Angular, which I covered in the previous screencasts, um, to add event handlers. And that's what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to use a, a, a custom event, um, similar to how we did communication from the top down using broadcast right here. Uh, we're going to use that to sort of create a decoupled um, implementation because we need a controller for our editor initializer as well. 
And in the controller, we're going to add that edit function. So if we jump back here, that's where this guy's going to live and this row. Um, we don't have a reference to the row yet. We'll cover that in a sec. Uh, first, we're going to implement the edit function. So we're going to stick it on the scope. Uh, it's going to receive a row to edit. Um, and then we're just going to broadcast for any interested parties and say, uh, we want to edit this row. Who's responsible for editing this row? Um, well, the linking function is going to listen to that. So it's going to get a function again with that event argument uh, and then any additional arguments that we passed to broadcast. So that row is going to map there. Uh, and then what do we want to do? Um, we actually want to create our editor instance, and we haven't done that yet. Um, but let's write the code before, and then we'll dive into what we're we're going to use. We're going to create a, an editor template to insert a row below. If I jump back here, we're going to basically clone the row with the number of columns so that it, it fits within the table. We're going to insert it in so that it pops below. Um, and then the context of the, the editors, basically the, the input elements, is going to be bound to that specific instance of the row. So we're assuming we've got our row instance, which we don't have yet. Uh, we're going to create the editor, um, which is an HTML element. We need to inject the compile service. We're going to compile. Compile takes a template string, uh, and then you pass it a scope, and it will return you the bound compiled result that you can inject into the DOM. So we want to get our template that we haven't created yet, um, the editor template. So let's assume that, for now, editor.html. Actually, I don't even want to type that because I don't want to give you the, the, the wrong indication. Um, we're going to assume that that template is pre-populated within the template cache. So we're going to grab that. Uh, and the key that it will be populated with is the template URL, this guy. So we're going to assume that we have template slash editor.html inside of that template cache. We can call get on it. Um, and then we want to pass in the scope. This will get us a compiled template. So let's let's not go any further than that, um, because right now we don't have the editor template implemented. So let's add the editor template. So again, let me try and pull this down. We're going to expand this table row so that it comes below, and we're going to insert another table row. So there's a few concerns that we need to know about in order for this to render properly. One, we need the value of the row and the column um, information so that we can fit it within. Uh, so we're going to have a TR with a class of editor row. So that's going to be what's inserted below. Um, we're going to need table data elements and the amount of width that we need, uh, we can do that with call span. This is going to be bound to a dynamic attribute because we know how many columns we have. So we can say calls.length, assuming we have the columns. Uh, so that's going to do it there. And then uh, let's just create a div and repeat for call in calls, similar to uh, what we were doing before. And let's add a span. Um, we don't want the edit column to show up. So this is some copy paste that we could probably get rid of with a, a helper function or something like that. Um, but we, we basically don't want to render the, uh, the trigger for the editor within the editor itself. Uh, we're going to have a label. I'm not going to use the for property. And then uh, I'm going to put the field value for that column in there. Um, and then we're going to have an input. Uh, it's going to have an ng model so that it's two way bound. Um, and it's going to access row at call.field. And that's what it'll be bound to. And this is going to give us uh, our editor. So this is a lot of a lot of pieces and there's a lot of density here, but um, hopefully I can connect the dots for you as we go. So we're compiling our editor and then we need to insert it. So if I jump back down here. So we've got we've got our template from the template cache. Uh, we're compiling it. We're adding the scope so that it has access to row and column, which I haven't given it access to. Uh, and then we're going to replace or insert our element right after. So we're going to use jQuery's method. So I'm going to select that editor element. I'm going to say insert after. Um, and I'm going to grab this element reference, which uh, maps to 
uh, the editor initializer element. And I'm going to look up the chain using parents tr. So that's basically going to insert it and find this guy here, this one. And it's going to insert it right after that. And if you remember here, so editor initializer parents, oh, not there, not there, not there, parents tr. That's the first tr that we encounter that's a parent. And it's going to insert the editor right after that. So if we reload this, let's see where we're going to explode. Scope is not defined. Right, because it's not dollar scope, it's scope in a linking function. Let's fix that. Um, and the other piece that we need uh, is in our editor initializer, we're using that ng click, so that should be bound. And it, we'll have to verify that it's actually working. Uh, let me make this big again. I'm missing a couple pieces. One is I didn't fetch the editor template and populate it in my template cache. So let's do that. Uh, and this is a way that you can um, uh, pre-populate templates that aren't necessarily going to be requested, um, or you want to pre or pre-insert them into the template cache. You can do that with template request. Uh, so let's make a template request right when we run the application for templates editor.html. So that should fire that guy. There we go. So now our template uh, exists there. And I'm just going to switch over to the console view because we don't need all this other stuff. So we had our, um, our functions compiled there. And now if I click, now you can see I got the editor. Uh, it's not quite rendering properly but that's okay. Um, or sorry, it is rendering properly. Our call span, if we look, is four. Uh, so it got access to the right thing. Uh, and I can type, and those seem to be bound properly. Um, I have a bug. If I can keep clicking, it's gonna expand the inline editor. Um, but I'm not gonna fix the bug in this screencast. Uh, there's a lot of density to this one, um, and I, I hope I've done it just as explaining the core concepts, but just to recap, what we started with was HTML that maps to custom elements that don't exist. Uh, we listed our domain objects as rows and columns um, and some uh, the concept of an editor and the ability to edit. And we're using Angular as a way to compile this HTML, map those elements into our domain concepts to create value objects, data objects. So our row objects, um, our column objects, and our editor object with uh, its ability to edit. The implementation of with inline editor was bound such that when this attribute is detected, it just adds a column to the list. Um, and then the only piece that's kind of gnarly about this that I don't like is we had to make all of the other directives sort of aware of the fact that editor existed as an implementation detail of that column. So if we look in the as table, we had to have, you know, if it's if it's not an editor, then yeah, go ahead and, and render that columns field. Otherwise, render this editor initializer. So that's kind of clunky. Um, but again, you could do this multiple different ways. And the point is not to say this is the right way to do it. The point is to give you some insight in how you can take that high level concept of custom markup, mapping it to domain value objects, and then on the other side, getting uh, the HTML you want rendering. That's part one of this screencast. I hope you found it informative. I, I probably moved way too fast, but you've got that slowdown feature. Uh, I'll also publish the slowdown feature on YouTube. I'll also publish the code on GitHub, uh, and you can um, take a look at the extra credit and the challenges. One of the challenges would be for you to try and fix that bug so that I can't click on this guy and duplicate it multiple times. The other would maybe be to add a toggle state to that arrow, so that it would point down when it's expanded and flip back to pointing to the right when it's not expanded. Um, and any suggestions you have for how to improve this code, things that uh, we covered, uh, directive communication patterns using require and how you require the name of the directive, not the, um, the controller, even though the controller is what's injected, using that caret to require up the stack, um, we talked about directive communication patterns using broadcast. Um, and yeah, I, I really hope that you enjoyed this screencast. I'm 
hoping to get into more of a regular cadence of producing these. Uh, and so if you have topics that you want me to cover, um, or if there's things even in this one that you want me to elaborate on in part two, uh, please feel free to reach out and I'd be more than happy to um, take that into consideration when I'm crafting the screencast that I'm going to produce. Thanks so much for subscribing.